Okay, this, um, is, this talk covers Introduction 19 on the truebibleco.com site, which is itself an introduction to Satan, Michael and Gabriel, who are the three key angelic players in the drama and education of the world and of mankind in the world, and before and after, actually. So, um, we already know from Intro 16 that Michael possessed Jesus during his whole ministry, and we know from Intro 18 that um, Gabriel possessed John the Baptist. Gabriel actually was Elijah. Jesus said, John the Baptist is Elijah, if you will accept it. And we know that John was to go in the spirit of Elijah, go before God in the spirit and power of Elijah. Well, the power of Elijah is one thing, the spirit of Elijah was Gabriel. <laughs> and John the Baptist went in the spirit of Elijah because he was possessed by Gabriel. And all these possessions of demons occurred because there were angelic possessions and Satan demands a, living, a level playing field. What we're going to first of all do is prove that the birth order of, of these three was not Michael first, but was Satan first. The original firstborn angel of all angelic kind was Satan, Lucifer which means light bringer. We'll start with 1 Corinthians 15, which says, who, referring to Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For all things were created in him, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and all things have subsisted in him. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, firstborn out of the dead, that he may be preeminent in all things. That's Colossians 1, 15 to 18, the Green's literal version. At first sight, this looks very much like it's saying Jesus was the firstborn of all creation, in the sense that he was the first creation, the first angel God made, since angels were created first and then humans. But verse 18 reveals that Jesus is the firstborn out of the dead. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean he was the first to be resurrected from the dead, because Elijah resurrected the widow of Zarephath's son in 1 Kings 17, 800 years before Jesus came along. It actually means that Jesus was not the firstborn until he died and was resurrected. He became the firstborn at his death, the firstborn out of the dead. Satan was not the firstborn out of the dead. To discover how, let us consider the common demise of the firstborn sons of nearly all the patriarchs, in fact I think of all the patriarchs, and these things we're going to consider, they're all patterns of patterns of patterns, and God is very fractal uh, in his works. And when there's a pattern of the genealogy of man, you can bet that it's telling you about the genealogy of the angels. Because we teach them and they teach us and we are the image of them and of God. So, here's the thing. Adam's firstborn son, Abel. Cain was actually not a son of Adam. He was a son of Satan. Uh, Abel lost his birthright to Seth by virtue of being killed by Cain. So there's the firstborn son lost his birthright to a laterborn son. Noah's firstborn son was Ham, who lost his birthright to Shem. We'll prove that later in this section. Abraham's firstborn son, Ishmael. He lost his birthright to the secondborn son, Isaac. Isaac's firstborn son, Esau, lost his birthright, actually sold it for a bowl of soup, to the secondborn son, Jacob. Jacob's firstborn son, Reuben, lost his birthright to Joseph because he slept with his father's concubine. Joseph's firstborn son, Manasseh, lost his birthright to Ephraim. And to cut a long story short, pretty much every major patriarch's firstborn son lost his birthright to a laterborn son. What is this telling us? Is there are no coincidences in the Bible that God is unaware of. There's plenty of them that we're unaware of, but there's none that he's unaware of. 
Will two meet unless it is by, co in, by appointment, says Amos? Uh, referring in one meaning to biblical coincidences. This is all a great big pattern telling us some important things. Now in Exodus 4.22 we read, Israel is my son, my firstborn. <laughs> well Israel wasn't the firstborn, he was the secondborn, but he became the firstborn because he bought the rights. But if he's a firstborn, Israel, this is genetic Israel, he's going to lose his rights to a later born son, the Christian. So one of the prophecies from all of the firstborn sons of the patriarchs losing their, their rights to a later-born son is that the Jews will lose their firstborn of God status to the Christians who were the firstborn by covenant, which is what matters. I once said this to a, I think it was a Jewish rabbi. I said, tell me why do you think it was that Adam's firstborn son Abel lost his birthright to Seth, and that Noah's firstborn son Ham lost his birthright to Shem, and that Abraham's firstborn son Ishmael lost it to Isaac, and that Isaac's firstborn son Jacob lost it to Esau, sorry, lost it to Jacob. And, the, and he said, I, I don't know, but if you're so clever, what's the bowl of soup deal all about? Which I didn't know at the time, but I know now. That's one meaning, but there's a greater meaning which we shall discover. Jeremiah 31 says, For I have become to Israel a father. And as for Ephraim, he is my firstborn. But of course, Ephraim was not the firstborn of Israel or firstborn of Joseph. Manasseh was the firstborn of Joseph. So the question is, did this thing that happened with all the patriarchs in the Old Testament happen also with the greatest of all the patriarchs, Jehovah God himself? Was Michael, who is now the firstborn, was he originally a firstborn, or did he earn it as a result of his spirituality, or did he buy it with a greater bowl of soup deal? After all, Jesus has twelve apostles, and that is prefigured by Jacob with his twelve sons, and Jacob's name means supplanter. We will consider two groups of scriptures, one set before Jesus died and one set after he died. So, here we are before he died. Look, there was a voice from the heavens that said, This is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. That's Matthew 3. Matthew 17, while he was speaking, Look, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and look, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my son, the beloved, whom I have approved. Listen to him. And likewise in Mark 1, You're my son, the beloved, and this is my son, the beloved. Mark 9 and Luke 3, You are my son, the beloved, I have approved you. Nowhere in the Gospels or before, did the true God say of Jesus or of Michael that you are my firstborn son, the beloved, I have approved you. It's all, this is my son, you are my son. But after the resurrection we read, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creations in Colossians 1, which we quoted earlier. And he's the head of the body, the firstborn out of the dead. And we read in Hebrews 1, but when he again brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth, he says, and let all God's angels do obeisance to him. But then we must realise one thing. Satan committed suicide inside Judas on the same day that Michael died in Jesus. We know this from Luke 22 when Satan entered into Judas. I'm jumping the gun here, but basically Jesus was resurrected prior to Satan being resurrected so that he would have actually been the firstborn out of the dead. Both of them were dead. So here's the question. Why was it that Satan was the anointed cherub covering Eden? We get this from Ezekiel 28. In the garden, in Eden, the garden of God, you proved to be. Every precious stone was your covering. Ruby, topaz and jasper, chrysolite, onyx and jade, sapphire, turquoise and emerald. And of gold was the workmanship of your settings and, and your sockets in you. In the day of your being created, they were made ready. You are the anointed cherub that is covering, and I have set you on the holy mountain of God, you proved to be. In the midst of fiery stones you walked about, that would be God's administration, the holy mountain of God, fiery stones would be the apostles of the Holy Spirit, first Holy Spirit. You were faultless in your ways from the day of your being created until unrighteousness was found in you. So the anointed cherub, I mean, we haven't covered this yet, but a cherub is somebody with a covenant. And if he's looking after Eden, he was doing that on behalf of God and who looks after the new, the new baby in the family, the mother? And the Holy Spirit we know is God's wife, 
And so Satan was running the Holy Spirit because he was the anointed cherub, he was the head of what was going on in Eden. And since the mother looks after the children and Adam was the son of God, he was the head of the Holy Spirit. And that's a right that the firstborn angel would have. So um, the key is to have a good translation of Daniel 10 and 1 Colossians 18. Uh, sorry, Colossians 1, 18. So Daniel 10, verse 13, says, But the prince of the royal realm of Persia was standing in opposition from it to me for 21 days. And look, Michael, one of the foremost princes. Now that word in Hebrew, a car, means one. It can mean first, but only with reference to the first day of the month, according to Cassinius. So it doesn't mean first of the foremost princes. It means one of the foremost princes. So at the time Daniel wrote that, he was not the archangel, which would be the foremost prince. Archangel means head angel. He wasn't. But we have to now harmonize that with Jude, because Jude said, but when Michael the archangel had a dispute, a difference with the devil, and was disputing about Moses' body. He did not dare to bring a judgment against him in abusive terms, but said, May Jehovah rebuke you. It's an ambiguous scripture, because it, it could mean that Michael was the archangel at the time that Jude wrote it, and therefore he gave him his full title, or it could mean that he was an archangel at the time of the dispute. But if to reconcile that with Daniel 10, it must have been that he was an archangel at the time that Jude wrote his letter, but wasn't at the time of the dispute. Paul makes it abundantly clear, if you have a good translation, which means New World or Young's literal, but not King James or Green's literal, of Colossians 1 verse 18. Incidentally, get Bible Linguistics, which is at BibleLinguistics.org. It's free and it's fantastic. It has all these things arranged in a way that you can just see at a glance all of man's lexicons, pretty much, and um, they're only good. Although we need to put the, the Ben Davidson one in, we haven't done that yet. And, and most of the translations. It's free, uh, except for the ones where I have to pay a royalty to the Westminster Leningrad Codex guys and to Deutsche Bible Gesellschaft. So the correct translation one of, one, of Colossians 1.18 is, and he's the head of the body, he is the beginning, the firstborn out of the dead, that he might become, ginomai, means become, to become in Greek, the one who's first in all things. That was the new world, and Young's literal has, and he himself is head of the body, the assembly, who is a beginning, a firstborn out of the dead, that he might become Ginomai in all himself first. So these two good translations of Ginomai show that Jesus became the first in all things, and that he became that out of the dead, i.e. when he was resurrected. But there's more to wrong foot you in the scriptures, because we must harmonize Proverbs. Jehovah himself produced me as the beginning of his way, the earliest of his achievements of long ago. From time indefinite I was installed, from the start, from times earlier than the earth, which sounds incredibly like he was the firstborn angel. It's begging you to fall for that. It's a classic dummy from the Holy Spirit. Earlier than the earth. Oh, that must be the first one angel. No, there was loads of angels before the earth. There was angels before the Big Bang, let alone the earth. From the start. Start of what? When he prepared the heavens, I was there. Proverbs 8. The beginning of his way, the earliest of achieve achievements, relates to the creation of a loyal character, not, the creation, not creation itself. Because what is God's way? <laughs> In his way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The first church is called the way. So there was God's way. That was Jesus' way. But God's way would have been, he would have been one of the first guys to um, get involved in that. To adopt God's way of doing things. I came to be the one he was specially fond of day by day. Had Michael been the firstborn, he would not have come to be the one. He would have always been that one. So Philippians 2 verse 9, for this very reason God exalted him to a superior position and kindly gave him the name above every other name named. In Revelation 3 verse 14, the counsel to Laodicea, these are the things that the Amen says, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation by God. <laughs> that really does sound 
like Michael was the firstborn angel, the beginning of the creation by God. But it's the same statement as Israel is my firstborn. Israel was not God's firstborn. He became the firstborn. And this one is Jesus is the heavenly firstborn, not by birth. He is the beginning of the creation by God, the firstborn. But not by originally being the beginning of that creation, but by becoming that beginning. Just as Israel did and just as all the patriarchs did. It's very difficult to, you have to keep your wits about you. You have to understand, the Holy Spirit seems to delight in throwing dummies to people who can't think straight and can't keep in mind the important things. And it's very easy to make mistakes as a result. Yeah, he's the beginning of all creation, but he wasn't the first one to be created. He became the beginning of all creation. He became the one that is first in all things, says Paul. But he initially was not the one who was first in all things, and the one who's first in all things is the beginning of all creation. This is like, you know, Simon says, and Simon doesn't say. You have to, you just, it's just logic, and you, you have to really think carefully. Everything has to harmonise or you don't have the true meaning. And we've, we've done thousands of incorrect interpretations by not harmonising everything properly. But hopefully from all those mistakes, we've got enough experience to get a few of these things right. He became first in all things. He actually bought that right from Satan. We know that Jesus ransomed Adam and therefore he became the father of all mankind. We know that. He owns us because he ransomed Adam, which means he bought us with his life. So why then is Satan running the show? Answer, he sold us to Satan. What did he get in return? Answer, firstborn angelic rights. That was a greater bowl of soup deal, which I don't think we have covered yet, but it's, I think it's under, understanding 17. Satan sold his firstborn rights to Michael for a 6,000 year kingdom over mankind, this being the greater bowl of soup, bowl of the red, Adam meaning red. Jesus needed those rights to fix the heavens. Okay, um, we're going to look at the birth order of Ham, Shem and Japheth, and we're going to compare it with the birth order of Satan, Michael and Gabriel. The one is an antitype of the other, because in the case of Ham, Shem and Japheth, one behaved badly and two covered it up. Ham behaved badly and Shem and Japheth covered it up. Whereas Satan behaved badly to God, their father, his father and the other two sons, Michael and Gabriel, covered it up. So there's a similarity between the three sons of Noah, the patriarch of all mankind after the flood, and the three sons of Job. So it says in Genesis 5, if you, if you believe the uh, New World, which is always uh, well. New word translations are good translation, but they don't get everything right. One of the terrible things they do is they can't use the word and. They always put when, after. They put all these words in the scriptures which aren't in the scriptures. <laughs> and it ruins the literal meaning and it even more ruins the greater meaning. And here's a classic example of how not to translate scripture. And Noah got to be 500 years old. After that, Noah became father to Shem, Ham and Japheth. Well, yes, it was. Actually, it wasn't after that. It was in his 500th year. It was not after that at all. After that doesn't appear in the Hebrew. It just says and. And, and the King James, Greece literal and Young's literal, translate it correctly. King James says, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Green's literal, and Noah was 500 years old, and Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Young's literal, and Noah is a son of 500 years. Very accurate translation. And Noah begetteth. Shem, Ham and Japheth. So, yes, when he was 500 years old, he had the first of them. Not after that, because if it was after that, he could have had a age 649. Genesis 7, verse 6, And Noah was 600 years old when the deluge of waters occurred on the earth. Genesis 11, verse 10, And Shem was 100 years old when he became father to Arpashad, two years after the deluge. So if he's 100 years old, two years after the deluge, he's 98 years old at the deluge, at which point Noah was 600 years old. So he's born when Noah's 502. But so he wasn't the firstborn, because he's born two years too late for that. So Shem was the secondborn, because there was an 18th month gestation period. We deduced that from the fact that everybody took 60 years before they had any kids pre-flood, and 30 years after. So you, you, ate, you matured at half rate before. 
the flow. And so everything took twice as long, including, we assume, the gestation. So shame is second born, but not the first born. We're going to look at a classic account. This is exactly like the account of Cain and Abel and the two offerings, where at first sight it looks like God is completely unrighteous and partial and just picks a favourite and, and rejects Cain's sacrifice for no good reason at all other than he's in a foul mood or something. And that's the Holy Spirit trying to sell you a dummy. Or putting it more positively, it's the Holy Spirit sorting out the sheep from the goats. And if you understand God's righteousness, you make the effort to interpret the scripture and you see the truth. And then, and then what Satan does is he, he tells the atheist there is no God. And he tells the people who believe there is a God, but don't worry, you don't have to interpret the scriptures because your priests will do it for you. And then you become an idolater of your priest. But however you look at it, in every church in the whole world, no one is interpreting the scriptures. And, everyone, and people who aren't in a church obviously aren't doing it. But people who are in a church, they're letting the priest do it. And the priest represents he can because he's from God, but he can't. End result, no one interprets the scriptures. But we're here to tell you that anybody who can read can interpret the book. Because the Holy Spirit delights in revealing things to babes, not to priests. Babes by which we don't mean people of young genetic age, we mean people of young spiritual or church experience. Because before he died, Tyndale, who translated the King James mainly, said it was his desire that every ploughboy should read the Bible in English, which is why he lost his life translating it into English against the persecution from the Catholic Church at the time, and actually the Protestant Church. But it's pointless having the book in English if you can't interpret it. So it's our job to persuade everybody, every ploughboy, not just to read the book and then ask the priest what it means, but to read it in a way that they understand for themselves what it means and interpret it and to see the righteousness and love and brilliance of God in his book. And that's what we're going to try and do now with this account in Genesis 9. Bearing in mind, if you haven't understood it already, have a look at the Cain and Abel account and see how that works. Alright, so here's the account, which we're all going to interpret on this in this video, well I'm, well, I'm going to reveal the interpretation we've done. See what you think. And Noah started off as a farmer and proceeded to plant a vineyard, and he began drinking of the wine, and he became intoxicated, and so he uncovered himself. There's no so, that, that's a new world. He uncovered himself in the midst of the tent. You don't automatically uncover yourself because you're intoxicated. Later Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and went telling it to his two brothers outside. Now at this point, bear in mind what it says in Leviticus 6 and 7. You must not come near any man of you to any close fleshly relative of his to lay bare nakedness. The nakedness of your father and the nakedness of your mother you must not lay bare. She is your mother. You must not lay bare her nakedness. So you're not supposed to be laying bare the nakedness of a fleshy relative or seeing it. I mean, it doesn't matter so much if you see it. It's the context. You know, we may, many of us may have seen parents walking around naked. This is different. You don't broadcast it, which is what happened here. He went telling it to his two brothers outside. Big mistake. He should have just covered Noah up and be done with it. Not embarrass him in front of his sons. At that, Shem and Japheth took a mantle and put it upon their shoulders and walked him backwards, showing full respect, so as not to see their father naked, and they covered him up. They covered their father's nakedness while their faces were turned away. They did not see their father's nakedness, says the scripture. Not the case with Ham. Finally Noah awoke from his wine and got to know what his youngest son had done to him. Now there you go. <laughs> At this he said, Cursed be Canaan. What? What's Canaan got to do with it? And okay, he was, he, Ham was his father. So what everybody does is thinks, Ah, well Ham must be the youngest son then. And, and God is of course completely unfair and unrighteous. And he just picked one of Ham's sons at random and cursed him. Ham, you're wrong, you're my youngest son, you're wrong, so I'm just going to pick one of your sons, uh, uh, Canaan, and um, I'll curse him. 
And that's pretty much the translation that, that everybody has. But it's not correct, because the youngest son of Noah wasn't Ham, because Ham had a son called Canaan. Canaan was younger than Ham, and they're both sons of Noah to uh, a Hebrew or to an early patriarch, and to God. But just as all the sons of Adam are, are sons of Adam, I'm a son of Adam. Canaan, the youngest, must have been the youngest son of Ham, and the youngest son of Noah. And Canaan did something. If he hadn't done something, he would have been cursed. And let him become the lowest slave to his brothers, it says. And he added, that's his brothers in Ham. And then he added, blessed be Jehovah, says Noah. Shem's God, which is good. Shem has the God of Jehovah. Uh, and it actually means he's got a covenant with Jehovah. It's a cryptic thing, but that's outside the scope of this. And let Canaan become a slave to him. And let God grant ample space to Japheth, and let him reside in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan become a slave to him also. So this poor old Canaan, he's becoming a slave to his brothers, a slave to Shem, and a slave to Japheth. Why? Why should he become a slave? Well, because eye for eye, tooth for tooth is God's justice. It hasn't changed, although the penalties have been modified by Christianity, and the penalties of the law weren't in place in the days of Noah, because vengeance seven times was pronounced on Cain. If you want to kill Cain, you've got to wait seven times. So there was no death penalty for the killing of people who act like Cain until um, 25, 20 years after Adam's sin, actually, which is when they went into the Promised Land, which is when the law kicked off. So here we have the youngest son, Canaan, and it says in verse 24, when you got to know what Canaan had done, what his youngest son had done to him. Not what he'd seen, what he had done to him. So he did something to Noah, who was naked. And he said, let him become the lowest slave. Slave, 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 slave. Now if Cain has to become a slave, because of, as I said, I find a tooth for tooth, Lord Moses, this means he must have treated Noah like a slave. And what you do with a slave is their body is yours, to do what you want with, to beat, to sexually abuse, to praise, you can do what you want with them, as long as you don't kill them, or damage them permanently, actually, under law. You deduce that Canaan treated his, fa his grandfather, which is his father in patriarchal terms, as a slave. In other words, he sexually abused him in some way, but he didn't just look at him. And Ham introduced Canaan to Noah's nakedness, just as he introduced his two brothers to Noah's nakedness. Only he introduced his son first, and he would have known that Canaan had some tendencies in that direction, being his father, presumably. So he set up an abuse of Noah by Canaan, did Ham, is what you deduce from all of this. Now, the end result of this abuse, apart from the cursing of Canaan, and Canaan was to become a slave of everybody, was let God grant ample space to Japheth and let him reside in the tents of Shem. Now, the tents of Shem are the family tents, and if they're owned by Shem, he's now the head of the family, which will be a prophecy for after Noah dies, which means Shem has taken firstborn rights, the having inherited the tents. And he became firstborn as a result of Ham's and Canaan's indiscretions. So he took those rights from Ham and Canaan. I mean, what Ham should have done, rather than broadcasting his father's nakedness, is he should have covered it up, and that would be the respectful way to treat your father. There we see that Ham was firstborn, Shem was secondborn, Japheth was therefore thirdborn, and Shem took Ham's firstborn rights after the incident with the nakedness and Canaan abusing Noah in some sexual way, presumably. And Ham setting that abuse up, although not doing it himself. He treated his father, his grandfather, like a, like he would treat a slave. Now that we know that Ham was born first, Shem was born second, and now that we know that Ham abused his father's nakedness, but the but the other two covered it up, we make the parallel with Satan, Michael, and Gabriel. We know that Satan abuses, well, he abused the nakedness of the son of his father, Adam. In a way, he abused his father's flesh, because he was married to. God in the first Holy Spirit covenant, and so his flesh was his father's flesh, and he slept with Eve. He abused his father, and the other two, Michael and Gabriel, covered it up. So 
Just as Ham was the firstborn who lost his birthright, who abused, so Satan was the firstborn who lost his birthright, who abused. And that is why, one of the reasons why, it's so cryptically written, this Genesis 9. It's written in a way that makes God, as usual, look like a partial, prejudiced and impetuous judge who just randomly picks on people and curses them for no good reason. It's written like that deliberately so that you won't know the truth unless you understand that God isn't like that, that his ways are perfect and all his ways are righteousness and justice and that he cannot curse Canaan and order him to be treated like a slave or prophesy that he will be unless Canaan had treated someone else like a slave. And he wouldn't just attack Canaan unless Canaan done something wrong. And what this all hides is the loss of birthrights of Ham to Shem. And when you see that, you understand that Satan lost it to Jesus, and that's a big sacred secret. Although, to be honest, it's not so hard to deduce, because why else would Satan be running this planet unless he bought it from Jesus? And what would Jesus want from Satan other than his birthright? But that's, that's, a, that's a deep secret, that. As I say, that's covered in Understanding 17, the, big, the greater bowl of soup deal. But I, that, the most important thing if, to take away from this is that the Bible is written in a way that at first cursory superficial glance God makes himself look like a, a partial imbecile. I don't mean partially imbecile, I mean an unfair, an unrighteous, a prejudiced Im imbecile. But that's a disguise. If you look behind it, you see a genius who is completely impartial. So we have an impartial genius disguised as a partial imbecile. And that's, that's how these scriptures are written. Thank you.